a lot of people mistaken their passion for working out as meaning that they're going to have this passion for training. So like, I love training myself. I love working out. You have to have a passion for people as well, but they don't necessarily know they ha- they, if they have that or not, but they want to, they like fitness so much. They become trainers and they're so idealistic. It just doesn't work. And what does that mean? It means that they assume everybody is going to be a fitness fanatic like them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, your client hires you. I want to lose 30 pounds. Perfect, Mrs. Johnson. You're going to work this, out this, me three this, days this. a week. <laughs> yeah. Two days a week, you're going to do cardio. Here's your meal plan. Here's how many steps I want you to take every day. We're going to go through your house. I'm going to throw away all the garbage, junk food. We're going to go grocery shop. I'm going to do all stuff. Not going to happen. Yeah. Most people work out because it improves the quality of their life. They want to be more fit, more healthy, but really to just improve their life as it is. Welcome back. It's Mind Pump time. Here's the giveaway for today. Look, in today's episode... We're talking to fitness coaches, trainers, or those of you who are thinking about being personal trainers or coaches, kind of talking you out of it because it's a tough job and we only want the best. Nonetheless, the giveaway is going to reflect that, right? I'm going to give away the MAPS Prime bundle, MAPS Prime, MAPS Prime Pro, the most important programs that we have for any fitness coach, trainer, great for anybody, but especially if you're a trainer or a coach. So I'm going to give that away for free. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Make it a good comment. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in that section. We'll say, hey, you win. And then that means you get that Prime bundle for free. Also, we got a sale going on right now. The Shredded Summer Bundle is 50% off. That includes Maps Aesthetic, Maps Prime, uh, Maps Hit, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. And MAPS HIT by itself is also 50% off. So if you just want to do one program, do MAPS HIT. You can find all of that at mapsfitnessproducts.com, but you have to use the code JUNE50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. You know, I hear a lot of people, when they listen to the show and they see me and they meet me or they DM me, and I know you guys get the same thing, Mm -hmm. tell me that they became trainers oh, I think or fitness coaches. Oh, smaller in size in person. That's no, that's not, what they say. <laughs> that's not what they say. <laughs> that's not what they say. It's for me. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm usually like, oh, wow, thanks. <laughs> wow. Wow, you're so much smaller in person. That's not <laughs> where I was going. It's not where oh, I was my going. bad, my bad. Sorry. Yeah. Was Sorry, what were you talking no, about? No, they, they say to me uh, that they became trainers or got, became fitness coaches because of our show. Uh, now, yeah. I find this funny because- we get that all the time. I, don't, <laughs> I thought we scared them away. Yeah, That's totally. what I was going to say. And, and really, I want to talk about be, uh, being a personal trainer because uh, it's not a job for most people. Yeah. It is not a job for most people. And I think it's important we communicate uh, why you should not become a personal trainer. <laughs> here's the 10 reasons why you should not become a personal yeah. trainer. Well, because it's, it's <laughs> look, here's the deal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with this. Some jobs require a tremendous amount of deep passion. Other jobs, not so much. Yeah. Some jobs you could show up. Do your job, and you know you like it. It's okay. You make your check. You make your money. You go home. It's all good. Other jobs, if you don't have a total desire, like a deep burning desire to do that job, it's gonna suck. And that's personal training. Yeah. Like if you don't feel like I, I, I didn't have a choice. That's the way I view it. Like I, I wanted to do it so bad, I had no other choice. Um, and that's what got me through, especially that first five years. It's just so. So challenging. Do you think? Do you think personal training is the only thing that's like? The, obviously, there's people no, right now. Jobs like that. I well, I think to just the off off uh, hand like entrepreneurs, like it, it just starting your own business in general is pretty parallel to personal training in terms of like just a lot of the hardships you face initially with uh, a lot of return. Yeah, yeah, but I, I mean, obviously, any job, the more passionate you are about it, the more successful you are. Yeah. But I do, I do agree with you. That personal training is unique. That I think you actually have to have a deep passion. Have for. to, yeah. Because some of the things that I think you, I think you're going to allude to later on in this episode, because you, uh, because you're dealing with so many people on a day to day basis, different and, people, and different people. Yes. If you lack the passion for what you're doing, that will wear on you really quick, oh, and you man. will. Be, where you cannot be passionate about computer engineering and you know and all you're doing is sitting at a desk as long as you don't hate it you could be well you could you could even hate it you you can can mess around on facebook you could play games or whatever while you're also doing right punching numbers so i guess the the professions where you have a lot of interaction with a lot of different people i would say would require that's part of it like i would put musicians up there i know we look at like famous celebrity musicians we're like oh my god that would be so great the vast majority of musicians 
are not that. And, and they, the ones that stick to it and don't become famous and make tons of money, it's that deep yeah, burning. They just love it. Yes, yes. And, and that's personal training. Here's the truth. The turnover rate for personal trainers. Super high. 80 to 90%. Yeah. Ideal turnover rate for a job, if you own a company, where it's like 10%. So like, and I experienced this managing gyms, like mm -hmm. until I became good at who I hired and how I trained and developed, you would see people come in and out all the time. Because again, it's one of those jobs where if you love working out, you think you you're going to love being a personal trainer. That is not true at all. You have to have a deep, deep desire and passion for fitness, but also for people. And it's for that, one of them is for that first point, which is you work with a lot of, you deal with a lot of different people. Like, you know, I've trained, you trained people from all walks of life, different ages, energy levels, oh, political man. affiliations, opinions. And you have to not only work with them, but you're working with them intimately in person, uh, working on their health and fitness, taking them, them through challenges. And if you can't deal with those different personalities, if, if somebody, if you're one of those people, it's like, oh, those kind of people annoy me. Or I, if you can't be a chameleon, you're screwed. No, you have to step up and mirror their energy. Yeah. And a lot of times that's, especially for somebody, and I'll just speak on my own behalf in terms of like being just somewhat of an introvert, um, but working one-on-one, -on -one, I tend to do a lot better with that, but still like having that kind of uh, high energy person that I would have to deal with every now and then I would have to just like sort of get myself in that headspace just to be able to provide good service for them because I want them to continue to keep resigning with me to enjoy the process, not just, you know, be on a level where I'm, you know, my, my energy levels might not be matching that. I have to exceed it. You know, you, you said it perfectly, Justin, by saying mirror their, their energy because it's not – a lot of trainers think you just need to have lots of energy. I did. So that was something that I was good at. I was good at being super full of energy and loud and, like, excited to yeah. train you. Yeah. But I quickly learned that I couldn't be that way with everybody. Uh -uh. So, like, what I, re I totally vividly remember, like, a specific day even of, like, I had this, like, crazy day of, like, I don't know, eight or nine clients in the day. And I had this, like – Client, and then client, and then client, and then client, and all like all four of them in a row were like so drastically different in personality. It was like an, an engineer, like a, a CEO, like an artist, and like I mean, they were just these just really random jobs and random type personality types that I remember being so drained because of how I had to switch gears for each person, and I, even being checked early on, like when I was learning this, like being checked by like the engineer guy, like dude, can you can you calm down? He like, said that to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been told by a client, like, you calm down. I'm like, <laughs> yep. you know, in my play to that is like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm just so passionate about what I do and I love doing this and excited. Like, but realizing like I, I was talking at a speed that was too fast for him. Uh -huh. Like he he was just like, I'm not here to get all well, hyped. You know, well, you get a like you either get people who are coming in first thing in the morning or after work or after they drop the kids off. They're gonna be in if you train somebody two or three days a week and you do it for five months, six months, a year, two years. I, I had clients that were with me for over 10 years. They go, th you, you see all their moods. It's, mm -hmm. They're not going to, you know, maybe the first month they're going to show up and they're going to put on a good attitude for you as well. But after that, you're dealing with real people and they show up and bad mood, annoyed, yeah. irritated, whatever, with their job, with their spouse, with their kids. And they're showing up to go do some hard shit and work yeah. out, which the reason why they hired you is they need help for it. And they kind of want to do it Oftentimes they kind of don't want to do it. So you have to deal with all that. And uh, that is exhausting unless you deeply want to help these people. And so you were talking about mirroring people and being a chameleon. Someone may think, well, that's not, you know, why would you do that? Why don't you just be yourself? Well, there's nothing wrong with just acting the way you want to act. But if you really want to help them you're in your passion to do so you really try to figure out ways to break down those no, this walls. Is a relate this is this is this is part of emotional intelligence this is actually what sent me down that rabbit hole of reading in that direction i really enjoyed that it's it's having social awareness yeah so it's not a i'm not being myself it's becoming aware of your surroundings and and understanding that not everybody receives and learns and likes to communicate the same way that you do. It doesn't mean that I, I change as a person. I just slow down the pace of what I communicate or you're trying to be I more effective. I say less with this person. I say more with that person. Mm -hmm. You know, this person needs me to be more loud and energetic to get them up. This person needs me to calm down and slow down. Like it just, to me, it's not, you're not changing who you are. It's just becoming 
self and self-aware and socially aware of your surroundings and it's just that's just emotional intelligence the ability to be able to recognize that and then develop that skill yeah and you and you do have to learn how to do this and do it well because you said it earlier you get drained yeah. otherwise so and the only thing that'll drive you and I'm, i mean again i'm going to go back to this but the only thing that'll drive you to be able to do this well because it is not an easy thing to do is the constant passion. I want to help these people. I want to help. I want to really want to do a good job. I really want these people to feel and see what I see or improve their life uh, through health and fitness. And I love it so much. And so it keeps bringing you back and it keeps bringing you back. But if you don't have that, I swear to God, after three months, you're going to be like, screw this. I hate this. I'm dealing with, I don't want to train that person. I don't want to train that person. I just want the perfect client, which doesn't exist. And it's going to totally suck. Um, the next one uh, is that Failure is literally baked into the job. Yeah. <laughs> There's very few jobs yeah. where you go do it and they're like, hey, here's the thing. Uh, 80% of the time, you're going to fail. So 80% of the time, <laughs> yeah. your clients People are not are going to be over it and they're just going to leave. They're yeah. either leave yeah. or they're not going to do what you tell them or you know it's not going to work. Yeah. And that is hard, especially when you're a, like a fitness fanatic because you want to be like, you want to shake people. Like, come on, just do well, what I tell you. You know, the, you got to deal with it. The hardest part is if you've had personal success and you have, you know, certain formulas that you've figured out you're on your own, whether that's nutritionally or training wise, and you're trying to pass on this knowledge and you're trying to express passion and um, get them on board with it. And maybe they do get on board, but it's not working for them because they have all kinds of their own individual needs and variables that might not be the right formula for them. Uh, and this is something I had to learn out of the very beginning was people just, that they're not going to move the way I want them to. And like, how do I reconcile with this? How do I figure this out? How do I get better at, um, you, you know, do you tapping remember, into that? Do you remember being confused where you're like, okay, we're going to do a squat and then they can't? You're like, huh? Yeah. Like, well, how, why can't well, you do that? Well, now what do I do? <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, let's go to the ground. You know, it's like, it's well, crazy. If you, you have to accept that again, that failure is a part of the job because otherwise it gets to you. It starts well, you to have to, to accept you. that you, you can't control all the variables, right? So, I mean, there's, they, they, there's responsibility on their part to follow the steps that you're teaching them. And the, and the fact is that many people are lazy, don't follow through. Uh, don't show up, you know, do things half-assed, lie. Like those are, that's all part of it. And so because you are dealing with, this is a team effort, right? As uh, I'm your coach, you're the client. Together, we're going to uh, try and achieve these goals. But there still is an accountability and responsibility on their part to execute. And it, I tell my trainers, it's a lot like baseball. Uh, baseball, if you bat 300, you're doing good. You're a killer. Yeah. You know what does what that mean? Yeah. You're like breaking records if you hit bat 400. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, that that means six or seven of the times you miss, you know, yeah. and that's kind of what personal training was like. It quickly re realized that. And I remember telling you guys this story. That was like when I realized, like, am I really that good? And I was looking at my trophies. I'm five years in and it's all for like sales and things like that. And I'm like, man, when I really think back to all the people that I've helped, it's like, man, it's like 25%, you know, actually really. Do I feel like I changed their life? And so that, that's terrible. <laughs> it's, yeah. I mean, it's like eight out of 10 people almost like that I, mean, I don't get to the goal, you know? Well, part th this is part of the challenge is where <laughs> you're training someone and they tell you what their goals are. This makes it even harder because it's like, you told me what your goals are. So they tell you what their goals are and it's not happening and they're not following your advice and they're not doing the stuff that you know will help them. And so you have to do two things. One you have to take it personal because ultimately you're the coach. So you have to say to yourself, what am I doing wrong? But then two, you also have to be, you have to accept it. That's hard. Well, on one hand, I take it personal. Okay. It's my fault. What's going on? On two, I gotta be okay with it at the same time. And that's the hard part of this failure being baked into the job because with other jobs, if you take it personal, you don't accept it and you hammer it. And this is what, this is where I get messages from trainers who are like, Hey Sal, how do I deal with a client that won't, count their macros. I keep yeah. telling them, how do I deal with a client that won't do exercises on their own? Yeah. And it's like, well, okay, number one, it's your fault, but also number two, because you're the coach, ultimately you have to accept that. But also number two, you have to accept that. That's okay. <clears throat> That's a hard, th those two things are hard to have uh, together in your mind. And people can't, a lot of, I've seen trainers not be able to deal with this. And what they'll do is they'll either hammer their clients 
And I've done this before early days. And it, I learned a really, really tough lesson early on where you sit a client down and you basically beat him up. You told me you want to do this goal. I'm telling you what to do. You're not following it. It's your fault. And you think that's going to help them. And of course the client disappears. And it's like, I'm not going back to that trainer again. This, this is real uncomfortable. And then you think to yourself, I mean, this happened to me. I thought, yeah, I told her. And I'm like, wait a minute. At least they were showing up once or twice a week. Yeah. Now they're not even doing that. What did I do? I totally <laughs> yeah. screwed up. Like this is not, this is not the yeah, right where approach. Where are they now? That's, it's like, how are you helping them? That's right. The next one, and this one's great because I know if you think being a trainer, if you if your goal is to make a lot of money and that's why you want to get into fitness, you're like, I like working out. Trainers charge $100 an hour. This would be a great way to make a lot of money. <laughs> you're in for a rude awakening. <laughs> it's a very, well, it's I, a very I, hard way to make money. I think this is directly connected to the the stat that you gave to open this up, which is that 80 to 90% of the turnover. And I believe that 80 to 90% is closely related to all sales jobs. Maybe Doug can look that up to, to, to fact check Sales me. jobs in general do have yeah, a high turnover. Yeah, sales That's jobs true. in general have a really high turnover rate, and it's because of the failure rate and the inability for them to make money. Many people get into a sales job because it sounds like, oh, I make this big commission on a house sale, or I make this big yeah. commission on a car rip, or, oh, a personal trainer gets $100 an hour when they train a client. And so you think it's like this going to be this high-paying job, and then you realize, oh, wow, getting leads – and then converting leads into sales or customers is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. So it's a it's a grind to make money. And so that's why I think the turnover rate is so high in personal training because it's very closely related to sales. And I didn't know this when I first started. It was actually – so the irony for me as becoming a personal trainer – it's actually what made me fall in love with training. I actually am not, I'm kind of an anomaly. So like when you, what Sal always talks about like, oh, well, what, what you should be like to be a trainer. Like I was not that guy. I was somebody who like kind of fell into it because I liked working out. And what I fell in love with was the sales aspect because sales was in my background. It was my family, everybody in my family did mm -hmm. sales. So I was, I was already a kind of a natural communicator and liked people. And then I realized like, oh, wow, this job is like all sales. This is kind of cool. Like, and I got into it because I enjoyed that aspect, but that's a lot ends up turning off most trainers yeah. is because they don't think it's that big of a portion of it. And so when I would hire people, because most of my job or my career was hiring trainers, I would lead with that. Like, hey, this is mostly a sales job. So if you're here and you just want to help people, yeah. <laughs> it's like just you're going to be in for a rude awakening because mostly sales and then it's a bonus you get to help well, people. Because yeah, and also the weird part is you're selling these people on work that they have to do. Yeah. Which is something like, not tangible and a dream and a dream and a vision of of what you, you know you'll be able to provide or, or or be able to get them on the journey towards that. It's right? such a great point. It's why it's the hardest sales. Yeah. And it's almost like I guess comparable. Like like let's say you're let's say you're somebody that can build a house or build like a, a some kind of like a shed or or whatever it is, right? And you're you're the person that's just going to sit there and tell them how to do each one of those steps, mixing the concrete. Do it themselves. You do it themselves. Then you get like, I'll provide the the hammer and the nails. I'm going to sit here and watch you and tell you exactly how to do it. Like, who's going to want to do that? <laughs> it, you know, and you, you have to like, you have to really be, and this is where that passion, we come back to the first point. It's like, you have to be insanely passionate about uh, uplifting this person and, and infusing that energy into Well, them. the truth is, People don't come knocking down your door to hire you as a trainer until you've already kicked ass for a long time. That didn't happen to me yeah. until much later. So you built the reputation. Until And it takes years. Yeah, yeah. It, it takes years to do that. If you're in a gym and you want to have the kind of reputation where clients come to you, but hey, can I please hire you? You're going to have to kick ass for a couple years well, at it least. Took me, it took me 10. Yeah. It, it, took it, me, it took me 10 to where I got to a place where- You turned people I down. didn't, yeah, to yeah. where I didn't have to go get clients. Like that, literally most of my job was actually turning down, raising prices. Same. And getting. It took 10 years to get there. Because mm -hmm. the first five was all about just loading my schedule. And during that, that time of like just trying to get my schedule loaded and get, like I had a good client base early on, but that's still at the time when I was turning them over so fast because I wasn't getting the results. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really changing their life because my focus, my, I, I was still at the, the hype, energy, push, motivation type of trainer in those early years. I really wasn't about long, sustainable results. I wasn't meeting them where they were at. Like I was the guy who was just like, you could commit to three or four days a week. Just hammer. Yeah, I'd hammer them. And then, yeah, they get a little bit of results or whatever for the six months they're training with me, but then they fall off the rest of their life or I'd never see them again. So yeah. it took me 10 years before I think I was really giving people what? that kind of results where they it, it would spread. Then people would go like, you got to- 
meet. And, so I mean, and the so. truth is, if you're in a, a, let's use a big box gym as an example, and let's say there's 20 trainers, which is a lot for a big box gym, and it's a successful big box gym because there's there's a varying degrees. Like you could have two different big box gyms, like 30, 40,000 square foot facilities. One is managed well, one is managed poorly, and the difference between the two is massive in terms of clients and revenue and all that stuff. But you take one that's run well with 20 trainers, what percentage of those trainers is making a lot of money? It's not 50%. It's, it's less than. It's 80-20. Yeah. 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 So that's the 80-20 rule applies to, to trainer success. Or this is definitely, this is what I did most of my career was training and developing trainers and like analyzing So it's like this. four out of 20. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Four. Most of, most of, I mean, we, we were talking about this off air the other day about like when you have a staff of like 20 trainers, I could literally, I could, I and, and ended up doing this when I'd inherit a staff, fire most all of them. I only had to keep the top two to three because they were responsible for 80% of the revenue for the club. And then I would try and find in a new batch of trainers that would come in, mm -hmm. hopefully that I could develop into being like some of those top performers. Yeah. Now, now uh, on the other end of that, the ones that do make a good living, make a damn good living. Mm -hmm. It's just really hard to do. And it takes a while and, and it's, it's a hard, it's a hard process. Um, and part of that process, and this is the next point is initially you work a lot of hours and you take whoever shitty wants hours to too, and that, that's what I mean by a lot of hours. So people are like, "Oh, you train non convenient. You, tra you trained eight clients in a day, so you worked eight hours. No, I worked four hours in the morning, yeah. and then maybe one in the afternoon, and then four in the evening because I, you don't do them. No, it's almost never. You know when I got back to back with clients. 10 years in when I got so good that yeah. I could pick clients based on the times I want to work out. You but guys it, know how awful I am in the morning. <laughs> okay. I was in there at like six. I'm, 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 I'm whenever, wherever, like that was just the, the energy and that I was trying to bring in to be able to, uh, get a good grasp of like, how, how can I get a handle on this business? How can I understand how to attract clients? Like I was like all in, if you're not all in, you're limiting yourself and your potential. Yeah. I, I remember, I remember like distinctly like laughing, <laughs> laughing trainers out of the gym when they'd be like, yeah. yeah, I was thinking I'd work nine to five. Yeah, I know. Nine to five. You have three like, clients. Yeah, you, you, if you're lucky, like, <laughs> yeah. to, like you have like two people at lunch. If so you're three lucky. Three hours in the middle of the day. Yeah. yeah. Nothing. Like the most prime hours are 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. and then 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Yes. So literally a nine to five is the opposite window of like when the prime hours of training clients are. And it, and so then you either one have to be, you have to choose to be, oh, am I going to be this late night person who tries to, to get all the night people? Or am I going to be this early night person? Or usually, am I going to be flexible? Usually that's what it is. And split and I'm going to come in the morning and I'm going to come in the night. And those are normally the most successful trainers that were open to doing that. And then later, maybe building your schedule to be more yeah, ideal. You work your way out of it. See, but. see, when I look back, when I first became a trainer, here's why I keep saying you need to be so damn passionate about this. I, my schedule literally looked like this. I would get in at 6 a.m. and I'd go 6 a.m. to noon. Then you get that lull. I wouldn't really train. So that's when I would work out, mm -hmm. hang out, eat lunch, do my thing. About 3, 4 p.m., new clients would come in and I'd train till like 9 or 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes a client, because I used to work at a 24-hour gym, would say, hey, you know, I, I want to buy training, but nobody wants to train me at 3 a.m. I'll raise my hand. I'll do it. I'll show up at 3 a.m. And I did. I had people that would show up in the middle of the night. Now, the, why did I do it? I loved it. It was so rewarding to me because I was so passionate that any if I could get paid just to be in the gym, yeah. that was like a plus. If I didn't have that passion, that would have sucked. You, you couldn't get me to do any other job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what fuel are you going to run on at that point? Bro? That's right. So it, it was just, I loved it so much, it didn't matter. And I took anybody and everybody and I worked as much as I could. So even though maybe you don't work in the middle of the day and you're counting four hours in the morning, four hours a night, so it's eight hours total. Reality is... It's like 12 hours, 14 hours in a day because what do you do in the middle of the day? Go home and do what? Take a nap and, you know. Well, and the point you're making right now leads really well into the next one. This is what makes the next one so hard is that you have to be on all the time. Yes. Oh, yeah. And so try being on all the time when you're not a morning person, but yet you're going to get up at five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Try being on all the time, but you're disrupting your nightly sleep to go train one person at three o'clock in the morning. Then you're going to turn right back around and get up in the morning or then you're going to wait. And you get the work. difficult personalities, you know, are coming yeah. in. It, it, takes a, it takes a special breed of a human to be able to turn it on like that, be a chameleon for all these different clients, and and also be flexible to work all these crazy hours. Well, name another job where you have to be on all the time. What I mean by that is, here's what we mean by that. When you're with a client, you're on. There is no break 
in the hour that I'm training you because you and, hired and me. And by the way, if it, there is one for you, I know you're going to suck as a trainer. And they, those exist, right? The trainer who's sipping on a Starbucks coffee while he's leaning on the machine and stuff like that. Yeah. Like Top that's texting not, or that's whatever. not on. No, yeah. <laughs> they don't make it. And, yeah. Everybody else in the gym is watching you that's too. Right. So prospective clients are not going to hire yeah. you based on the behaviors they watch and, and observe. Yeah, most jobs, you know, you have your break, you go to the water, you know, what are the water cooler, you hang out, you talk to your staff, your 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 coworker. You go on a walk. You know you're not full, you're not like super energized because you're doing some projects, so you can kind of just be chill or kind of tired or whatever. When you have a client in front of you, your job is to be on. I can't. My client can't show up and me be like, eh, "I'm kind of tired today, so you know, whatever." Yeah. You do if you, I'm not going to talk to you for you an just hour. Just figure yeah. this one out. Yeah. Um, uh, fired. You're fired. Yeah. They're not going to. They're not going to want to work with you anymore. So if you are on, I, I, I've said this to trainers before. 30 hours of personal training a week, meaning where you're training 30 sessions a it's week. like a 50 or 60 hour That's job. That's like a 50 or 60 hour job yeah, yeah, a totally. week because yeah. you're, you're, it's, it requires so much energy because when you're with a client, you are on and that's it. And then if you're in the gym when you're not training a client, and I used to tell my trainers this as well, if you're going to sit there with that look on your face and look like you're half asleep, get out of the gym because when you're in here, you're still on, even though you're not training a client, because you are the trainer. Yeah. You have your uniform on. They recognize you. You represent fitness and health. They, you, No one's going to want to hire a trainer that looks like they're half dead or like they don't want to be there. It just doesn't work that way. So it's one of those jobs. It's like, you know, uh, it, it's almost like media. Like if the camera's on you, you got to be on, right? You got to mm -hmm. be on when you do it. But imagine doing that for 40 hours Well, a week. Justin brought up a really good point. I can't – I believe it was the average – a client shops a trainer for six months before they make the decision mm -hmm. to buy. So, which is really powerful when you think about it. So that means that that person has been watching you train, work out, take your lunch break, sit at the desk. Like they've been watching you in the gym for six months before they get the courage to come up and ask a question, a buying question, potentially. I'll never forget yeah. when I, when I, that really struck me. This was probably, I want to say my, my, I was early trainer. So I was a kid, right? 18 years old. And this woman comes up to me. And she goes, I want to hire you as a personal trainer, which is strange, by the way. People typically don't walk up to you and say, I just want to hire you, um, again, until you've got a reputation that takes a long time. But she did say that to me. And I said, what makes you want to hire me? She goes, well, I've been watching you, and there was this woman, this older woman that needed help, and you were the only one that walked over to her and helped her, and you really spent a lot of time with her. She watched me, and I had no idea mm -hmm. that she watched me, but that's what convinced her that she wanted to hire me as a trainer. I had a run in with my peers when I was 20, like really early on because uh, I was so different than the rest of the trainers as far as the energy and stuff that I brought to the gym when I would train clients. Oh, they're hating on you. That their their clients would come to the, this was before I was a manager, where I was just a trainer, would come to my manager and ask to switch from their trainer oh, yeah. because they'd see the way I was with them, mm -hmm. my client. Because I was so interactive, we were having fun, I was engaged, I was loud, it was just like, I brought that to every single client, and that wasn't my intention, my intention was I'm trying to shark my my peers, you know, clients or anything like that, but it naturally happened, because I was like that, so, and then of course I had other people that just came off the floor and said, I saw the way you are with clients, and so, that, that happened, that impacted me really early on, so it was a it was a consistent message that I would present yeah. to my trainers, that when they work for me, it's like, man, you guys have no idea how important it is that when you walk through those doors, whether you don't have a client for two hours or you're on a break or you're just coming to work out, you're on. I'd even say that too. Even though it's your, your go work out somewhere else. If you want to be all That's depressed and down and negative and not a smile on your face and be that person, like go work out at another gym and stuff like that because people are, they're watching, they're paying attention. They know who you are. You represent, yeah. you're, you're the representative of, uh, of fitness and health. Yeah. This next one is such a tough one for trainers, especially because I said this earlier, a lot of people mistaken their passion for working out as meaning that they're going to have this passion for training. So like, I love training myself. I love working out. You have to have a passion for people as well, but they don't necessarily know they have, they, if they have that or not, but they want to, they like fitness so much. They become trainers and they're so idealistic. It just doesn't work. And what does that mean? It means that they assume everybody is going to be a fitness fanatic like them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, your client hires you. I want to lose thirty pounds. Perfect, Mrs. Johnson. You're going to work this, out with me three this, days this. a week. <laughs> yeah. Two days a week, you're going to do cardio. Here's your meal plan. Here's how many steps I want you to take every day. We're going to go through your house. I'm going to throw away all the garbage, junk food. We're going to go grocery shop. I'm going to do all stuff. Not going to happen. Yeah. The vat. Look at one percent of that, maybe. At ninety out of a hundred clients, you may run into one or probably zero that will ever become fitness fanatics. Yeah. Most people 
work out because it improves the quality of their life. They want to be more fit, more healthy, but really to just improve their life as it is. They're not going to make fitness they their life. They know it's good for them, but they <laughs> want to do it uh, the, as, as minimal as possible, yeah. right? Like, so I'm here. I did the work. I'm here. You tell me what to do. Yeah. Uh, and you get a lot of clients like that that just, uh, you know, some of them really just – didn't want to be there. And, and, and how do I deal with that? Because I'm a, I love fitness, dude. I love working out and I, I have all this passion towards it, but how do I deal with somebody that doesn't even want to be there well, and, I also, and motivate them? I also made the mistake of letting them kind of dictate my plan when I, when I probably knew what was best for them. Meaning like a client would come in and say they want, they want to lose 20 pounds and they want to lose as fast as possible. What do we need to do? And so I would have the idealistic plan, you know? Yep. Okay, if we want to lose the most amount of weight in this amount of time. Yeah, that's what you said, so here it is. Exactly. So that so then I write that. Older, wiser, more experienced me realize that even though they're telling me that, I know where this person is coming from and I'm actually going to do like a takeaway on them. I'm, I'm not going to let them do all, even though I know that- I'm going to set them up for failure. Right, why. because what I know they're going to either get burnt out, they're going to be too sore, they're going to not commit to it, it's their, they, or they're going to think that it's unrealistic for them to stay with it, or they're going to go above and beyond that and even burn out even faster. And so quickly I learn like, okay, like I know this is ideal, but I need to be more of a realist about this. This person hasn't trained at all most of their life and they're thinking they're going to come in five, six days a week and do that. Like, sure, they might be able to do it for a month or two, but that's not realistic to keep them long term doing this. And so I'd have to kind of back out. And even though I know that there would be a faster route to where we're going, I had to start to consider like all the other factors, the behaviors of, of people when it comes to exercise. Yeah, faster is not better. Uh, better is better. Right. I, I say I've said this before on other podcasts when I get interviewed and it's and this is true and this is just. This is what it took me a long time to figure this out. But if you do a damn good job, you're a really good trainer or a coach, and you're, you're you've got deep passion for it, and you've got good experience, and you 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 really coach and guide the person the right way. For most people, the most you could hope for, okay, is about that that you'll get them to be able to exercise two or three days a week consistently for the rest of their life. That's it, two or three days a week. So if you look outside, you look at the average person, you're like man, I could change all these lives. The most you could do if you're damn if you do a get damn good job is to get them to be consistent with two, maybe three days of structured exercise and maybe a 50% improvement in the relationship uh, they have with their diet. That's about it. Now you might run into the occasional rare fitness fanatic, but guess what that person ends up doing? They eventually become a trainer or get into the fitness mm -hmm. space, which has happened to me before with clients, but it's super rare. So you cannot be idealistic. You can't as a trainer or as a fitness, somebody who loves fitness, think to yourself, oh, I'm going to get this person to just, they're going to love it the way I do. Like I fell in love with lifting weights. I loved it right out the gates. Most people, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're going to do it and I can help them develop a good relationship with it, but they'll never develop the 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 love for it and the uh, the uh, the enjoyment of the process. Or else they like would became trainers. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's why they're not 100 <laughs> percent Here's another one, and this one this one really used to annoy me. It still does, and that is as a trainer, you will often be judged mm -hmm. uh, by how sore you make someone, how much you hurt them, and how much you make them sweat. Mm -hmm. And the reason why this sucks is because. This, especially if you're a new trainer or you're not very experienced, it'll feed into your ego and you're going to make them more sore and more sweaty because they say they like it. Oh my God, what a great workout. I could barely walk. Or, oh, you got to, I saw John train You've so and so. seen nothing yet. And she was sweating so hard. Oh man, I want you to really beat me up. I mean, how many times do you get a client that hires you and says, oh, I want you to kick my ass? Yeah. Like, like, really? That's what you want from me, huh? That's not what's going to so work. It's hard because there's, I mean, we there is this fine line of us being in, you know, being, perf, you know, almost like he we're health professionals. And at the same time, too, we're in the service business, right? These people are paying for a service from you. So there's a part of you that like, okay, this is what they want. And this is what they're paying for. And they're telling me this is what they want. Yeah. So you feel this, like I should give them what they want. But then I also know this is probably what's not best for them. So that was a, this was a hard one for me mm -hmm. for a long time. 
I remember for a long time going like, I I know what's best for them, but they are paying me and this is what they want. Yep. So I'll give it to them, yep. you know, but knowing that I should have them do other things. And then you get, and then you, you decide, oh, you know what? I'm going to stick to my guns. I'm going to start training people the way I know they need to be trained and you train them. And then you're getting pushback of like, are we going to just do these movements? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, are we, are we really going to stay on the floor for this long? Yeah, and like, then your ego's like, all right, I'll show you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then you abandon that, even though you know, that's probably what's best for them to help them out. You abandon it just to show. I'm like, I'll show you a cool exercise. You know, you want to try something really hard? <laughs> you know, yeah. so here you go. Yeah, it's this weird, like, masochistic kind of energy coming in. Like, it's like pain, atoning for their sins of, like, you know, eating poorly <laughs> or, like, not moving. And, totally. And it's just weird because, like, I I totally fed into that. Like, wow, okay, I'll, you know, I'll try and do what you want because this is obviously something you're paying for. And, like, you have these expectations coming in. And as a young trainer, you you want to fulfill those needs. And so my athletic background, I'm like, oh, I could show you a, a really, you know, tough workout. It's gonna <laughs> I, can, I can make it so you don't I walk do for that. two days. Yeah. yeah, you know, the, there's two things that are challenging about this. One is the root of this is the person is trying to change their body because of self-hate, right? They hate their body. They hate mm -hmm. how they look. So pain must be a part of it. I must suffer mm -hmm. because, like you said, atone for my sins, you know, type of deal. So that's number one. And that's a hard thing to to get them to change. Yeah. And then number two, this is why it's hard. It's the actual, it's actually the opposite. If I, let me put it this way. If I, if my mom said, Hey Sal, I want to go hire a trainer and uh, I want you to let me know if, you know, I'm going to tell you kind of what happens. And then you let me know if they were good. And my mom comes back and goes, Oh my God, I'm so sore. I could barely move. I was sweating so hard. I'd be like, they're a terrible trainer. It's the exact opposite of how you should feel after a workout. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't have hard workouts. I'm not saying you shouldn't sweat. I'm not saying right. soreness isn't a part of it, but you should feel better after your workout. You should move better. You should have more energy. So it's the exact opposite. So people are judging you on what they're thinking is a good trainer is actually what's a bad trainer. Mm -hmm. And that makes it really hard because you actually want to do the opposite. And they should feel like they learn something every time. Yes. They, you, you want to keep providing them with knowledge so that way they can apply this later on for themselves. This isn't this reliance sort of model that, that trainers fall into all the time where you know they're they're only going to experience this here with me. Um, no, you want to set them up for success long term. So you know all these things come with uh, experience, obviously, as you get through. Totally. Now this next one is the reason why we started Mind Pump. Um, I can't think of an industry, maybe besides politics, where most of the information is bad and wrong, like the fitness industry. <laughs> yeah. Like the, the fitness, health, weight loss, diet industry, lump it all you know together. The information is so wrong and so terrible. And then when you're training someone, especially when you know what you're doing and you're good, you're constantly battling this. And I don't mean like with new clients. Clients have been with for years. I'd have clients I'd train for five years and they'd show up and be like, hey, I heard of this new HCG diet where I inject HCG and eat 500 calories a day. Or, hey, uh, my doctor said I could just drink these shakes and lose weight. Or, hey, I have a friend that did yeah. keto. Or I had a friend that did this. Or what do you think? And and you have to constantly counter the wrong information. And you also have to do it in a way to where you're not condescending in a dick. Because because <laughs> you want to be. I'm wearing magnets now for my pain. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, what? Where did this come from? Very hard yeah. to do. That, that's because diet and exercise culture is very much so like religious. Yeah. It's very, very dogmatic. And there's so many camps yeah. in our space. It's not It's not black and white. Um, like many other industries and spaces where it's just like, you know, two plus two is always four or even in the medical space. Like it's pretty, it's pretty black and white there it, here. It's so nuanced. There's such an individual variance. There's so many different ways to skin a cat. Like, you know, you have so many different people that have different nutritional needs. And so, so many different things can be applied to so many different types of people. And what ends up happening is you get all these different camps and then all this, these these studies that come out tend to have a bias already behind them to support one community's argument for why their way is better, whether it be their way of eating or their way of exercising. And so it's such a challenging job as a trainer is that you are constantly taking an onslaught of all these studies and all these people that are trying to tell you that, oh, I read this, that I should do this for that. Or How many times have you had a client debate you over yeah. some crappy diet? Oh, and yeah. you're just Way like, too many times. Oh, and, and I mean, not... 
again, not being condescending or annoyed by it is a really hard thing well, to do. Because they always have anecdotes that they'll bring in. Yes. And they always have somebody they can think of in their family or a friend that has had crazy good success, even though it's only been for a couple of weeks mm. or whatever the case, right? It's not long term, but they lost a ton of weight. And I want to do exactly that. And I'm like, well, now you have to <laughs> take, take that all that extra time that you're going to ha have working out explaining uh, exactly why that's probably a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah. Now this next one is kind of a part of it. And that's that when people hire you partially because of the false advertising and crap of the industry, and also partially because people just think this is the way it works when you start working out or whatever, is that they expect instant results. And if you're a good trainer, you're sitting there and you're trying to tell this person who has read article after article saying you could lose 30 pounds in 40 days or you could take this pill and it'll do this for you. And you're going to have to tell them, hey, uh, for the first few months, um, I actually don't want you to lose any weight at all. And losing 30 pounds, you know, if we do it the right way, it's probably going to take us, you know, it could take us eight months to a year to do this the right way. Like that is a, like you're, you're literally telling the person, sorry, I know this is what you want. This is what you think, but I'm not going to do it. And then they go to a shitty trainer or they read an article and like, but this, this says I can do that. Like that is a really tough thing to. Yeah, no, again, cause you're in a service business. Um, I used to have this extreme analogy that I would give to somebody that would say that to me, like, Adam, I just want to lose 30 pounds as fast as I possibly can. What you just tell me what to do. I'll do whatever it takes. And then I would say back to them like, okay, cool. What I want you to do is I want you to stop eating for the next 30 days. You're going to come in here and spend three hours on the treadmill every day. And you're going to, you're going to definitely lose your 30 pounds by that time. You'll probably die too, but we'll lose the 30, <laughs> we'll lose the 30 pounds on the way there. Right. And they would, they would chuckle and laugh. And I say, well, you know, I use that crazy analogy because obviously I'm not going to tell you don't eat for 30 days. Obviously we're not going to run on the treadmill for three hours a day, but it's a spectrum and this is what people people gravitate towards that in that extreme end where they want to just overdo it restrict as mm -hmm. much as possible run like crazy because they want to lose as fast as they possibly can but what you don't realize is what we're doing to the body by doing that i'm not setting you up for long term sure we'll lose the 30 pounds in a few weeks but the likelihood that you'll be able to maintain that and the likelihood that you won't put on exponentially more than where you're currently at right now, right after that, is really, really high. So if that's all you care about is, oh, I just want to lose weight as fast as we possibly can. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just stop eating and we'll move like crazy. And that will cause the dramatic weight you, loss. But I'm also going to screw you up along the way. Totally. And that brings us to the last one, which is it's a long process. Um, and it, it's because it's not the results that, are, that take a long time. Because I could get somebody results very quickly. It's because we have to develop behaviors that are permanent, that stick around and relationships to exercise and your body and nutrition, we have to develop those and those take time. Your activity levels and especially your relationship to food and your relationship to your body, when you hire a trainer or a coach, like they're pretty solidified. Like you've, you've developed these over years and years and years. Like most clients are not 10 years old. Most clients are 30 years old or older. And these are, th this is how they've been living their whole life. And now they're hiring you and you're like, we're going to change how you feel about all this stuff. Yeah. That doesn't happen in one month or two months or three months. No. Like I, I like to tell the story. I had a client who hired me who the, his whole life dealt with uh, being overweight and he would gain weight and lose weight and gain weight and lose weight, had hired trainers before, uh, bad trainers in the past and that kind of stuff. And he hired me and his goal is like, okay, well, my goal is 35 pound weight loss. But luckily by this point, He'd already gone through so much failure that he was like, I don't care how long it takes. He goes, I just want to do it the right way. And I said, oh, that's, you know, uh, that's great to hear because that's how I train people. And it took us, I think like two and a half years to lose 35 pounds. Now here's what happened. The vast majority of that 35 pound weight loss happened in that last five month period. So for two years, he lost almost nothing. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we had to work on developing these behaviors and relationships to things. And there was no judgment and it was a slow process. But then when things started to click, they started to click real fast. And I know you guys have seen this with clients as well. Mm -hmm. Towards the end, the weight started coming off. By the way, this was, I want to say 12 years ago. And I know the guy, I still talk to him on, on social media and stuff. He still exercises. He's still consistent. You know, he works out three days a week. He's never gained the weight back. Yeah. Never gained the weight back. This is 12 years later. Now I could have technically got him to lose 35 pounds in, you know, eight to 12 weeks. Uh, but it wouldn't have worked out the same way. So well, it's a very long process. Yeah, I mean, I, I hate to use bad analogies, but it's it's like uh, the lead the horse to water. Yeah. You know, you can't force them to drink, but uh, I mean, you can force them to drink in this situation, but it's not uh, it's it's not going to be sustainable. Uh, and, and so at that point, you want to. 
you want to be sort of the vessel there and, and keep providing them with information on how to do it, how to change the behaviors. But really, it's going to amount to them deciding one day, like, oh, it just like clicks sometimes uh, for certain people at different uh, areas along the journey where it's just like, wow, this, okay, this makes sense. And then it's just, boom, it, it just starts to really accelerate. Yeah. From there. Now, now, I do want to say this. I know we're talking about why you shouldn't be a trainer. Um, I do, I do want to say this. Okay. If you do have that deep burning desire, uh, to help people and the vehicle is fitness and health. Cause you love doing that as well. Almost nothing is more rewarding, um, than being a personal trainer and all the stuff I just listed won't even matter to you. It didn't matter to me. I went through all of it and I didn't care. And it, this is a true story. At one point I left the industry and got into finance and investment and, and I literally got a salary that was higher than what I would make as a personal trainer. And I lasted, I think it was seven months. Hated it. I, I sat in, in a bank and I talked like this and I had air conditioning in the background, no music, and there was no gym and it wasn't the same thing and the, and the staff wasn't the same. And, and I remember I couldn't, I couldn't, it was not rewarding. Helping people really improve the quality because almost nothing you can do will improve every aspect of the quality of your life, like improving your health in a real way. It's like having a kid, dude. It's it's the mo it's one it's of the like most- it's, it's like having a kid. It's one of those things that it's hard as shit, but it's one of the most rewarding things ever. Totally. My sister right now, who's been working for the company for almost five years, so she's accumulated quite a bit of knowledge from all of us. She's gone through a certification. She's helping out a family friend of hers, and she's personal training them. And she's been texting me the last couple of weeks and she's like, oh my God, it's like so amazing. And she's like really, the girl she's helping is really overweight and deconditioned. And she's seeing like great progress right now. And just in different things, mobility, her energy, mm. you know what I'm saying? Like her confidence, like she, my sister's reporting back all this stuff. And you can hear in her voice how excited she is. And so this is why, this is what kept me doing this for this long. Is it's extremely yeah. rewarding when you do it. You may only hit the ball you know, three, three out of 10 times. But when you do, man, a lot, a lot, and it's, it's a good hit and you make it and you make an impact on someone's life. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly rewarding. It's really, really rewarding. And part of, part of why I think it is so rewarding is because how fucking hard it you is. You know, it's yeah. funny. I'm going to, so I'm going to put you on, on the spotlight here a little bit, Adam. I come in this morning to work out, right? So I'm, I, I get an early 6.30, 7 o'clock workout. Adam's here training a client. Doesn't need to train a client. None of us need to train clients. I don't even think she pays you anymore at this point, but she's been working with you for so long mm -hmm. and you feel um, like a responsibility and a connection to this woman. Yeah. How long have you trained her? Uh, years now. We're like four, oh, actually, fuck, before the podcast. Seven now? God, I can't believe it's been seven years. Yeah, so seven it, or eight years now. Right. And it, 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 again, that kind of reflects on, on the passion yeah. and, you know, that you had for it. It's, there's almost nothing more rewarding. And fitness and health is, is a, a incredibly powerful yet unassuming vehicle for personal growth. And you'll see these people through the years become better people. Um, so if you do have a passion for this um, and you do feel compelled, that's the right word because I felt compelled to do it. There's nothing more rewarding and I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave the industry for anything. And I've gone through periods of making very little money doing this. So on the flip side, if, if all the stuff that we're saying doesn't scare you away, and if anything, you're getting excited over it, well then, it's probably for you. It's probably Made for, for you. you. But if I just scared you away, good. Don't do it yeah. because it's going to suck. We just saved you some time. <laughs> so look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. The rules that apply to somebody who is going from, a man who's going from 20% body fat to 15%, the rules that apply to that person are the same as the, the rules same. that go from 10% to 5%. The difference is everything that we talked about.